Random X Productions and the Credible Nerds present The Fourth Taviran, a Wheel of Time podcast. The Wheel of Time turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. Let the dragon ride again on the winds of time. Welcome everyone to the fourth Taviran, a Wheel of Time podcast from your hosts, the Credible Nerds. My name is Justin, and as always, I have my co-host and fellow Taviran with me, Mark. Hey guys, how's it going? And today we'll be covering chapters 11 through 15 from The Eye of the World, which is book one in the Wheel of Time fantasy series that was written by Robert Jordan. And the last two episodes, we've covered a couple prologues as well as all the chapters up through chapter 10. So if you haven't listened to those, uh, go back and listen to those first two episodes to catch up um, and kind of find out what's what's been happening lately. But this episode, we'll start off with chapter 11, The Road to Terran Ferry. Is it Terran or Taran? I always say Terran. I say Taran as well. Um, I, I've heard it uh i think they say terran fairy in the um audiobook so that's i just stick with it yeah one thing i read on online somewhere this past week was that um about the pronunciations of the of the names we've kind of gone over that in the previous episodes but um because everyone says things differently right mm-hmm. but, um i guess for the first audiobook maybe the first two audiobooks the the readers contacted Robert Jordan be like, Hey, how do you say, uh, 90 or how do you say Moraine? You know, all these words, how do you say I said I, and he told them. And then he says, Robert Jordan said that they, after the first or second audiobook, they just quit calling and they kind of made it up <laughs> what sounded best for them or what was easy for them to pronounce as they were reading the story. So, uh, that's, I thought that was kind of funny cause I always thought, well, because I knew they had contacted Robert Jordan to get the correct pronunciation, but apparently they stopped after a while. So, <laughs> how do you say these names? Well, I mean, I, I can only imagine. Like, these books are long, and you probably have like, uh, you know, two or three hundred words. Like, hey, how do you say this? How do you say this? And I'm sure that they just are like, okay, yeah, we've called them like a thousand times. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I <laughs> that makes sense, but kind of funny because they have the if you read the books in the back they have glossaries and they they tell you how to pronounce the each name yeah and even with the glossaries right justin and i continue to pronounce things different so uh you know whatever whatever it is so yeah and someone likened it i think it was on twitter someone likened it to well if you're in the south you know the deep south you're going to say different words than if you were in you know the west or california or new england right everybody says the same word differently. So it's, it's kind of, I think it's a good explanation. You know, it's not so different that you don't know what they're saying, but it's just a different way to pronunciate these words. So I thought that was good. So chapter 11, the road to Terran Ferry. Um, last we left our group of ad- adventurers, which is Lan, Moraine, Rand, Matt, Perrin, Tom, and Egwene, and Bella, of course. Uh, they were leaving the two rivers, Emmonsfield, and heading off into, you know, they're headed to Tarvalon with the Aes Sedai to be safe, to escape the Trollocs. So this chapter picks up with that, and they're headed up north on the north road, and they're going to um, Watch Hill, which is the next town, and they're just kind of going by the cover of night trying to hide and uh, they're running the horses pretty hard and uh, Moraine is is healing the horses and that's one thing that's revealed in this chapter is that um uh they're the boys are kind of worried about the the horses but Moraine's touching them and kind of healing their tiredness and but Moraine marks that remarks that uh, Bella 
is is not as tired as the rest of them. So it's an interesting fact that we'll address later. But while they're while they're doing that, they hear the drag car, you know, which is the flying murderall basically. And they hear the the drag car scream, so everybody gets all worried and they jump back on their houses their horses and start galloping into the night once again. Um, Moraine uses fog to envelop the the riders, the group. Um, she calls, you know, she's able to control the weather just a little bit. Um, so she calls forth fog to, to hide them. So they keep riding and riding through the night. They eventually make it, they make it to Terran Ferry. And as they get to the village, uh, they go to the house of the, the guy who's in charge of the ferry, who happens to be named Master Hightower. Now, does that sound familiar to you, Mark? Uh, Game of Thrones, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure Game of Thrones, uh, the High Towers are um, kind of a big name in the old, the old kind of old guard, right? When Ned Stark was young, but uh, yeah, okay, I remember them both. So yeah, High Tower. Yeah. So apparently, that's a, a common name in these fantasy novels. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, so they get Master High Tower. It's still the middle of the night. They get him up. They pay him a lot of gold, and they get on the ferry and cross over. So that's the the basis of that chapter. Uh, pretty pretty straightforward, you know. I think the only interesting thing really is that Moraine uses the one power a couple times in this chapter. Um, mm-hmm. We see her use it to heal the horses, and we see her call forth the fog. Something that you know only I said I or someone who uses the one power can do. Mm-hmm. When it. Uh, I mean, it doesn't make sense now, but uh, you kind of get to see the the width, the breadth, whatever the word is, of Moiraine's power, yeah. right? Because, uh, I mean, kind of jumping ahead, we see Varen talk about, you know, they, they ask her to change the, the weather in book three, and she's like, yeah, no, no I can't do that. You know what I mean? It's like, no. <laughs> and... Uh, um, what Moraine most definitely can, and so to, to you know affect that larger of an area is quite a feat uh, in it, in and of itself. And you, and you learn that you know you gain more perspective of it later. But it, it's pretty amazing. Um, and then I had forgot when I was reading this that we had been introduced to Dragcar um, this early in the book. Yeah. And how much you just didn't know about it. You know, you just didn't uh, get a lot of information. And um, I'll be talking more uh, about uh, the shadow spawn. That's what, uh, you know, all the evil armies are called the shadow spawn. I'll be talking more kind of in depth about those. And, in, in, uh one of my uh, side writings that I'm going to do about, um, but drag car are actually, uh, you know, really dangerous in their own right. They're pretty feared. So, uh, that there was one there following him kind of shows how uh, not how desperate I guess the dark side you know uh, the dark was to try to stop stop these guys that yeah. they were drag car yeah they were going all in if they're sending Murdral Trollocs and a drag car all all at once to get them mm-hmm. so yeah pr- pretty cool um, uh, you know the drag car but basically w- what drag car is is like a crazy evil human being with wings, right? Like kind of like a, like a vampire, I guess would be the closest yeah. uh, thing I could get to it. But they're pretty, they're pretty neat. Like I said, look, look for that. And we'll talk more about drag car, what they are, Trollocs, mid roll and stuff, because it, it doesn't really go into super depth about them, but uh, there, there's some, uh, they're fun, fun to talk about, you know, kind of scary and kind of gives you a little bit um, grounding about what, what they can do. Yeah. Definitely. So they're able to rouse the the master of the ferry to get across the, the river, the Terran River there. Chapter 12 is is called Across the Terran. So pretty pretty basic chapter headings here. Road to Terran Ferry, then across the Terran. So, oh. um, here they're they're able to to cross it. There's like this uh, ferry that they get all all the the group and their horses get on it and the the guy, Master High Tower, has these helpers that pull the rope and pull them across the river. I guess it's pretty wide and fast running and deep, so it's dangerous to just you know build a bridge or whatever. But that's how they they get across. They get across and land pays them some more gold. 
and there's kind of a hint that uh, Master Hightower and his group are going to attack those guys and steal their money, but um, Rand and Matt and Perrin kind of get their weapons ready and put their hand on their sword type stuff. So <laughs> Tom pulls out a dagger and he's trimming his fingernails. So I thought that was kind of funny that they kind of nonchalantly say, Hey, don't mess with us or we're going to kill you. So <laughs> Master Hightower and his goons kind of leave with what they got. Yeah. It's a, uh, so these chapters are kind of um, right here in the middle. I don't know. They kind of, for me, they're, they're not really super boring, but it's just kind of, mundane a little bit right you're just kind of reading oh we're running and yeah. there's more woods and there's more woods and we're going to go over this hill and look there's more woods so <laughs> um you know uh but there's a lot of good side information in these chapters so it's good to read it read them kind of understand you know read between the lines type thing yeah um, so you know stick with it here i, I know these chapters are going to be slow for you, but um, it, it really starts picking up um, as we get through. So like these last two chapters uh, up until chapter 13 is just almost the same chapters. Yeah. But they move pretty quickly. I mean, they're running and you kind of get that anticipation that uh, fear of something chasing them. So, I mean, you read through, I read through them pretty quick. So mm -hmm. but, like I said, not much happens, but um in this chapter, we do see they they take uh, they get across the Terran and they keep going, and then they find this resting place that Lan has prepared for the group. Um, and they kind of go hide under these trees that are in this big pile. At least that's the impression I got. So um, Moraine and Egwene kind of go off to themselves, and they start talking, and um, Lan. And the boys are outside of the that uh, those trees and are talking as well. And then when the boys go in to the where Egwene and Moraine are, they find that Moraine is teaching Egwene about the one power, and she actually shows Egwene how to channel the one power, how to use the one power to create a small light. And so Moraine kind of, I think she kind of jumped the gun here, but. She seemed she must have been pretty excited, but she says that, you know, Egwene, you've done something that's not many women who go to the tower to train learn that quickly. She's picked it up really quick, and she may even become the Amarlin seat one day, which is like the the head I said I. And I thought that was when I first read, I was like, wow, that's you know, here she is, this farm girl, and she's going to become head I said I someday. But <laughs> um, yeah, she says that and. Definitely some foreshadowing going on there. Mm. Well, and it makes you wonder too, like, uh, because as you'll read through these books, uh, Aes Sedai are like the, the best manipulators in the world. So it makes you wonder if when they recruit, if that's what they say to all, every girl, like to get them yeah. excited. They come like, oh, yeah, if you leave home, you could become the most powerful woman in the world. Uh, while scrubbing <laughs> that's a good by. point. <laughs> so you know i kind of wonder because you know they can't lie we learned in uh earlier when I mean, we talked about it that, that um i said i can't lie and but that's not necessarily a lie right she may she could one day become a Merlin or anybody could become a Merlin, you know that goes to the white tower but the likelihood is so small but you can say it without lying i guess it's yeah. one of those things there's a 0.01 percent chance it could be you yeah, such a thin, uh, thin layer. And we'll learn more kind of about the, uh, the three O's and stuff like that, that the, uh, I said, I take later and kind of the, their sneaky ways around them. Yeah. So Egwene's excited and she tells Rand, Hey, I'm going to be an I said, I, and Rand and the boys, his friends, Matt and Perrin are do not like that at all. So there's mm -hmm. a little conflict there. Well, and, it's, and you kind of learn later that it's such a misunderstanding, right, that uh, people fear this power from the women. Uh, and, and it mostly comes to because of the breaking, right? Uh, yeah. The breaking happened because of the one power. And now these women use the one power. But it's just, it just really all comes down to this huge misunderstanding that these people have of it. Yeah. Uh, and so they're just, you know, they're just scared. Their whole lives they grew up, you know, oh, you know, the Aes Sedai are wicked or they're crazy or they'll kill people no they won't kill people they'll kidnap you or you know whatever it is so uh you know they're just 
totally against it. Like, how could you, you know, it's, it's against everything that we knew when we were growing up. Yeah. Yep. So then we transition into the next chapter, chapter 13 called choices. And, um, as they kind of goes back to the group and Moraine uses the power to kind of do the same thing she did with the horses where she, kinda, she takes away their tiredness and they're able to, to keep running and riding the horses. Um, in this chapter, the start of this chapter, Rand, Matt, and Perrin, they think they're only gonna be going to be gone from the two rivers, from their home for a short time. That They're going to you know, just go on this adventure. They're going to go to Tarvalin and then come back home and everything's going to go back to normal. So that's kind of their mindset. It's just, hey, we're going to go on this quick adventure, come back, it's going to be fun, everything's going to be cool when we get back. So... Uh, but Egwene, her her mindset is, hey, I'm leaving. I'm not coming back. I'm going to the the tower, uh, learn how to be a nice to die, and a little more forward thinking than the boys are. Mm-hmm. So they get back on their horses and head out again uh, towards Barillon. That's the next city on their stop uh, to the, to Tarvalon, and they're still headed north from the two rivers. Um, so they keep going. They they stop again for the nights. And Rand, he, he's kind of upset with what's going on with Egwene. So he's, he wants to kind of listen in on what Moraine and Egwene are talking about. So they go off again to talk, and uh, Rand sneaks over and starts to listen. And we hear Moraine, or I guess we don't hear, Rand hears, and we're told through him that uh, they talk about the five powers, um, how um, Moraine is telling Egwene, kind of like what you're saying, that the I said I, the, the female I said I aren't, aren't evil. You know, they're not the bad guys. The the men were the ones that went insane and broke the world and kind of went crazy and did all these crazy things and hurt people. So um, she kind of gives Egwene a rundown and reassures her, hey, it's going to be okay. There's going to be some, you know, some stuff going on in the White Tower. You'll find out there's there's good I said I, and then there's not necessarily bad, but they're not, you know, ones you want to hang out with. They're manipulative a little bit. Some, some are brave, some are weak. You know, you just, you don't know. They're all, they're all kinds of I said I. So she kind of gives uh, Egwene the rundown of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of too where we learn like the different ajas, right? They talk about like the blue, the gray, the brown, et cetera. Is that right? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I know she talks about the the five powers, earth, wind, water, spirit, fire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much if you watch Captain Planet back in the day, it's pretty much that. <laughs> yeah, or um, Avatar, The Last Airbender. <laughs> yep, yep. So apparently uh, there's just only so many elements. <laughs> yeah. So, but no, it's pretty cool. But yeah, I can't remember if they talk about the Aja's here. Um uh, but, uh, you know, we start getting a better look into who the Aes Sedai are, what they really stand for. Uh, and obviously, it's, it's kind of a one-sided conversation because there's no way Maureen's going to be like, yeah, we have these Ajas and we're, we totally fight against each other. So <laughs> yeah. we, we, we learn more about that really, I guess, in, in late book two and book three, uh, when, once we get to the White Tower. But uh, um, it, it's pretty interesting to learn more and more about the Aes Sedai because there's so much to know. And uh, so it's always fun when they talk about it. Pay attention because it'll do you uh, a lot of, it would benefit you a lot later in the book. Yeah. <clears throat> so next stop, they come up on Berlon. Uh She tells the group, hey, you know, here, my name is Alice and Lan, his name is Andra. So don't call us by our real names. So they head up to the gate. The gatekeeper sees them and lets them in because he knows more rain. Um, he tells them the white cloaks are in town and, uh, you know, watch out for them because they're there to cause trouble and white cloaks are another major player in the story. You know, we're, we see them this early in the book in chapter 13 and they're pretty much there the rest of the story. So the white cloaks are kind of, I guess you could say they're neutral, but they're, what is it? There's like chaotic, good, neutral, good, you know, that sort of thing, that whole mindset. Mm-hmm. And they're definitely on um, in the neutral side. They're they don't they have their own agenda. I'll just say that you know they want to be in power. They want to rule as much of the land as they can. 
they feel like they have, you know, their mission is the right one and the Aes Sedai are evil, all that sort of thing. So they're, they're more like a, um, they're kind of like a lawful good character. Is what yeah. I mean. Like too lawful. Like, yeah. Like, you know, and, and we'll meet, I, I don't want to spoil anything. So I'll skip what I was just going to say, but um, <laughs> uh, we'll meet some characters that will, will completely, you know, when they talk about this character, you're like, Oh yeah, that's a white cloak. And that's what a white cloak is. You know, they are lawful good to the, um, they could be chaotic though, because they kind of like, they have their own belief system regardless of the law. And that belief system is, is what it is, right? Regardless, yeah. like we don't care what the law says, this is what's right. And, you yeah. know, we kill anybody to accomplish our goals. And the way I see them is they are like the fanatic zealots of the, um, uh, the Templars, yeah. you know, of like Knights Templars or something like that. They are just these crazy fanatics almost. And, and there's some big names throughout the white cloaks and, and we'll read more about them later, but uh, they, they play a big part in this book. They're never going to disappear. And it's, it's so strange that they're just always around there. Like, even if they're not a major player in uh, certain events, they're always involved in like every event. So it's completely crazy how, how everywhere they are. So, um, but uh, they're a lot of fun. I think, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of interesting characters that come in and out of the um, white cloaks and, uh, and we'll continue to read about them. And, and same thing, I'm going to talk more about the white cloak structure and uh, who's who and in, in another uh, um, writing that I'm going to post. So look for that and we'll let you know when you get, we're gonna, I'm going to do this and they'll be fun to read into because same thing, it, it tells you a little bit, but it doesn't just go into the, all the nitty gritty of everything. You kind of have to read about that on the side. Yeah. So this gatekeeper, he also mentions a false dragon in Gildan. And there's an army. So that comes into play a little bit later down the road as well. Um, but they, they enter the city of Barillon. And here we hear first about the Carathon cycle from Tom. Tom tells Rand a little bit about it. Uh, talks about the dragon reborn. Because because of the false dragon that they just heard about, Tom starts telling a little bit, a little bit more about the, the real dragon. Rand doesn't know what to think of the prophecies, but um, you know this is the first time we hear about that. And then they arrive at the, the inn called the Stag and Lion, and Moraine and Lan know the, the innkeeper there, so he lets him inside, gives him some hot meals, and gets him you know takes good care of him. So that's the that chapter and chapter fourteen. They're they're at the Stag and Lion Inn. They're there in Barillon. Um, they get all cleaned up to take some baths, that sort of thing. But, uh, again here, Rand takes a nap. He likes to nap apparently. <laughs> and as he does, um, he has a dream about Balsamon and Balsamon is there chasing him and he kind of tries to escape, but he can't. Everywhere he goes, Balsamon's there waiting for him. So Rand starts to engage in a conversation with him. He asks Rand about the Eye of the World. He asks about the Amberlin seats, if, um, if the Amberlin seat's going to use them. So Rand's kind of freaked out, and he tells him that, hey, you're supposed to be bound in Shea Al Ghul, which is the, the headquarters of the Dark One. And this is kind of an interesting point, because we hear that Balzaman is one of the, the Forsaken. So he's supposed to be bound with the other 12 Forsaken, you know, in this prison, basically. Here he is, and Balzaman says that he's he's never been bound. You know that's not, you know that didn't happen to me. I was with Luz Theron when he killed everyone when he created Dragon Mount. He was there to whisper in Arthur Hawkwing's ear and kind of direct his thing, his his campaign. And then, you know, so he says throughout history, I've been there. I've influenced. Didn't he say something about the Trollock Wars too? Yeah, he was there for that. So he's supposed to be bound, but yet here he is, you know, popping up throughout history, creating chaos. So that's that's an interesting topic. Um, so Rand thinks he's dreaming, but then Balzaman makes these rats break their back to show him that he's not dreaming. This freaks out Rand, and he wakes up. He kind of 
gets up and that's when the chapter ends. So I don't know if you want to talk about Balsamon now or if we want to save that for a different episode, but yeah, this, this is such a broad subject uh, because um, you know, who bought, you know, what we know about Balsamon so far, right. Um, you know, he's around, his eyes are, are fire. His mouth is fire. Um, you know, they, uh, I think we find out actually later he's a forsaken, <laughs> but uh, right now they think he's the dark one. The yeah. Ba- Baalzman is the dark one. He is, yeah. you know, and is what they call him, you know, and he is supposed to be bound in Sheol Ghul and, and not away. Uh, we find out later more about his his origins and who he really is and, and things like that. Um, it, it's kind of hard because I don't want to give a lot away uh, with Balsam because there's still a lot to learn about him. Um, but I think one of the things I can say is that we find out kind of um, that he is forsaken and why he was able to touch the world where other forsaken weren't. And it just basically explains it, that he was trapped on the edge well, you know, uh, and I talk about this in the breaking, uh, and we'll talk more about that a little later. But um, he was bound when they created the the prison with the um, Quendalar. Yeah. Uh, he was bound just below the surface of the prison, and so um, he was able to uh, kind of escape that on a on a certain basis like every hundred years or thousand years or whatever it was and touch the world for a time and then he would be bound again Uh and so uh but it talks about that he is the first forsaken to be able to escape uh you know and and i guess that gives it away there'll be more forsaken coming (laughs) uh but he is the first one that's out and um, you find, you know, as I've been reading, you know, the side stuff, the extra books, the white books, things like that, you find out that he escaped probably two or three years before, um, he, like full time, like he was full time out two or three years before that. And he was definitely out, uh, when Rand was born. So what is that like 17 years ago? So he was definitely out then, but he was out full time two or three years before the events of this book. All right. Yeah. So that's Balzaman right now. I, I always wondered as the story progressed and, you know, things expanded that if Robert Jordan left Balzaman kind of, because he never defined who he was until after this book. So I think maybe it's like, well, if this book doesn't do well, then I really don't have to worry about, you know, clarifying who he is or anything like that. I just kind of got that sense that he wrote this book in general, there's a lot of po- plot points that they they do make sense later on, but if they hadn't continued with the story, then it wouldn't have mattered. It would have been pretty plain. You know, he was the dark one. So I don't know if that makes sense. All right. And in this chapter, Rand sees Min, even though he doesn't know her name. He just kind of sees this girl in men's clothing with short hair. Um, and she looks at, at Rand and leaves and let's see yeah Min's, so my, we, Min's my favorite by the way Min's your favorite uh, yep um of the three that'll mm-hmm. make sense in like 10 books but of the three she's my favorite <laughs> yeah she's my least favorite i can't decide between elaine and uh the other one I'm not going to name. I already gave too much away. <laughs> Who's Elaine? No. That sounds made up. Anyways, we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> let me transition into the next chapter called Strangers and Friends. You know, Ran, he wakes up from his crazy dream that he had. He sees that Lan has, has left. He goes downstairs, and this is when he, he finds out about the, the rats. So in his, in his dream, uh, Balsamon broke the rats' backs. And he talk. He goes downstairs to the kitchen. He kind of sees um, the cook there, and she's talking about all these dead rats that their backs have been broken. So Rand's like freaked out about that. He goes finds Perrin, and Perrin says, "Oh, I'm not feeling well. I had some bad dreams too." They kind of talk about it, and they realize, "Hey, this is the same dream. Balsamon's in both of our dreams." So that was kind of strange for them. But uh, Rand wants to go out and explore, so he leaves. And on his way out, he, he runs into Min for the first time has a conversation with her and 
uh, she starts telling him some things that uh, is kind of far out there, but they're compelling. So she tells him that she sees things about people and the pattern. She sees these images, these auras around people, and that um, they're all that, um, Rand, Matt, Perrin, and Egwene. They're all tied together. They're all going to you know, be a huge influence on the pattern. And she tells him about Egwene that, um, you know, they love each other, but not, you know, they're not going to end up together basically. And that they're just not meant for each other. And she also tells him some other things that she sees his blood upon the rocks and he's on his, his deathbed and there's three women there uh, looking at him. And so just things like that. He's like, okay, I don't want to hear anymore. (laughs) And he leaves. (laughs) <laughs> it's like, okay, Kook, uh, give me my hand back yeah. and you have a great day. Yeah. And I'll send someone to come help you. But the thing with men, especially when you go back and do a reread, all the things that she says come true. Everything, right? Like, and I've been noticing that too, like, as I'm doing a reread and she'll say something like, oh, well, that makes sense now. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, so pay attention to what she says. Uh, I, I promise you, she sounds kooky, but. She is a big part of the story. Yep. So he takes off and starts wandering through the town. He runs into Pat and Fane, who was the peddler from the first couple chapters. Uh, and he went missing, if you remember. Uh, you know, the Trollocs attacked, and, and he's just missing. We have no idea what happened to him. Yeah. So Ren chases him down and starts talking to him. He's like, hey, where you been? What you been up to? And Fane kind of is trying to avoid him and blow him off. And Ren thinks that's kind of weird. But then Fane, he's all nervous and fidgety and he kind of takes off and runs off, runs off. which, uh, you know, that would kind of give me some some red flags. But Ren doesn't see those flags. And he's like, hey, my buddy Pat and Fane, who I've talked to like twice. <laughs> Well, they kind of knew him before that too, though, right? So like they, I mean, while- Oh yeah, he came like every best, year, right? Yeah, why they might be best friends. Like he, he's, he knows who he is, you know, it's not that they're strangers. Yeah, that's true. So he goes chasing after Fane, but he runs into Matt and Matt and Rand start talking and say, hey, did you see Pat and Fane? And that sort of thing. And then they talk about their dreams. They find out that, hey, they're having the same dreams too. And all three of them are. And they all think that's really strange for that to happen. And then they run into some white cloaks and Matt kind of runs off and hides, but um, uh, Rand's kind of stuck in the street. But Matt kind of breaks these, uh, like there's these barrels on the side and he kind of breaks the thing that's holding them and they roll off and splash mud onto the white cloaks. And one of them, um, the, the leader, is actually ends up being a, a major player throughout the story, uh, Bornhald. He, he gets mad at him and confronts Rand in the street and they see his sword and they start to, to ask him questions and to kind of corner him. And he tries to avoid answering him, to not talk to him. But um, throughout that confrontation, the city watch shows up and then the white cloaks leave and Rand and Matt take off and head back to the, the inn again. They meet it, meet up with Tom and they tell Tom, hey, we've been having these dreams about Balsamum. And Tom's like, shh, don't say anything. You guys are crazy. Don't say that name here. So he shushes them and he, Tom tells him to be quiet. Don't talk to anybody about it. And so they go back to the inn. They meet up with Perrin and they say, hey, Perrin tells them, hey, Nynaeve's here. She's come. She's tracked us down. And then that's the end of the chapter. Mm-hmm. So uh, with the when he splashed the water, was that Dane or was that? That was the kid, the son. It was the son? Yeah. Oh, okay. The younger one. It wasn't Lord Bornhold. This, yeah, it was Dane. But yeah, it must have been Dane because Jepham wasn't so, I don't know, un- impatient, yeah. I guess is the right word. Not that he's a patient guy, but. Dane's a little fanatical. Yeah, a little bit more. On the crazy side. Yep. So, yeah, that's kind of what happens in these these chapters. It's interesting. I think I mentioned last time, the last episode, that um, having Nine show up later and track them down after the fact, I thought was kind of strange. Why didn't she just? Leave? Why didn't Robert Jordan put her with the group at the in the beginning? And I don't know. For me, it seems kind of like well. He realized he needed another female, another strong female to be there to balance out everybody or because later on some stuff happens and she ends up going with people. And so I think she needed to be there and he realized that after the fact, but I don't know because when she joined the whole dynamic of the group changed. 
for, mm-hmm. for the better. And I, I really like her and how she <laughs> tries to you know, take control, but yet she's slapped down by Moraine and, but yes, she still keeps trying. So I think it's, it's a good conflict there. So I like it. Yeah, no, she, she definitely brings a lot of, uh, a lot of fun, like, I don't know, dynamic to the group, right? I don't know if it's necessarily fun because it took me quite a few books to actually like oh, her. Oh, yeah. But now the I, first time I didn't like her at all. Yeah, but now, I, like, after a while, I, I was like, man, she is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And so, but, um, it's, you know, it's just good. It's good. So I think that, like you said, you know, Daniel didn't come and there was a certain, uh, how to say a mesh on the group yeah. that they he needed to fulfill, and so Nina Eve or Nini Eve or however you want to say it, it kind of fulfilled that. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely like that. She was uh, included in the group from here on out. But yeah, any thoughts on on these five chapters that we just talked about? Uh, what's your overall take from from these chapters? Man, uh, I, I I think that. Uh, one of the things maybe to take away from this is that there's a lot of great base information, right? Uh, it's late, you know, you're laying down the brickwork for a huge story. So don't get discouraged. I've talked to some people that have been like, oh man, it's just too slow or it's too, too hard of a read and stuff like that. But stick with it. I promise like this is setting down some great um, groundwork for later, especially with the children of light or the white cloaks also known as the Children of Light. Um, uh, with Pat and Fane, we get to kind of see him and, and his craziness, and that's going to come out more later. And, um, you know, with them running and what they're running from, the drag car chasing them, and it's just a lot of fun. It's just going to keep building, right? The book kind of builds from here and builds and builds and builds, and all of a sudden awesome things happen, and then it builds some more, builds some more, and awesome things happen. And, I mean, we're like – three or four chapters from awesome things happening. So uh, I, I think it's fun. It's just building uh, more and more. I think, you know, that's a good takeaway from it, you know, for a first time reader. If you're not a first time reader and you're, you're joining us, you know, as, as a, a reread as well, I think it's interesting to note for me, I, I kind of look at these dreams and st- stuff that he's having. And in the very last book, Rand says to Balsman, he says, you know, I don't know how you did those dreams with me, you know, when I, when I first started out, I still haven't figured it out. And Balsman never tells him. <laughs> he kind of like smiles slightly like, hmm, you know, so I've always wondered like how this all happened and, and, you know, how he did it all, but it's never explained. So I've always tried to figure it out myself, but I'm not Robert Jordan. So I don't know. Yeah. So if anybody has any insight, uh, let us know on social media or send us an email. Let us know what you think. Um, Cause yeah, I mean, like you said, these chapters lay some serious groundwork. The the first couple of chapters, same thing, uh, but they were stuck in Emmons Field. They didn't go anywhere. And these chapters, they're running. They, you know, there's there's a lot of action and stuff like that. So it's a lot more interesting. But still, this is all just groundwork for the rest of the story. I mean, Pad and Fane, huge character. Uh, we see that he didn't die in the the Trolloc attack on the two rivers. We meet Min. We meet Dane Bornhold, another huge character, and it, it, they go a long way. I mean, this we, you know, what we saw from Bornhold in this chapter, that's how he is the rest of the book, and you know, just kind of lays the groundwork for him and what he does. So a lot of great stuff in these chapters, and like you said, in a couple more chapters, it gets good, it gets better. So stick with it. Mm. But yeah, so that's our episode of chapters 11 through 15 next week will be 16 through 20 yes and you want to listen to it because chapter 19 is hopping <laughs> things that get amazing it's probably one of my favorite chapters in this book yeah yeah that part's one of my favorites too yeah if you have any questions or comments or want to give us feedback or anything definitely reach out to us on social media we're on twitter instagram facebook under credible nerds and you send us an email at credible nerds at gmail.com just let us know what you think if you like our show if you feel like we could do a better job let us know what that is so we're always looking to improve and get better and if there's a segment you'd like to hear and hear on our show that we're not talking about let us know if you want to hear more about bella let us know <laughs> 
because you'll hear plenty about her <laughs> in like literally every book and every event that ever happens. So yeah, let us know what you think. We love talking about Wheel of Time. We're looking forward to the Amazon TV series that'll be coming out hopefully next year, later this year. I haven't specified when that is, but we're looking forward to it. Um, like we talked about earlier, I've been Wheel of Time readers for about 20 years now. So definitely it's a, a dream come true for us. So let us know what you think. So yeah, definitely follow us on, on social media. Also support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash credible nerds. Um, get some extra bonus coverage, not only for the fourth Tavirin episodes, but our other nerdy episodes that we talk about where we review movies, TV shows, books, um, just general nerd news. We have our bonus content there on Patreon. So check us out there, support us there if you, if you want to. But we appreciate you listening to us and we'll catch you next time. See you guys.